Uh, it's Hannah, H-A-N-N-A-H, Payne, P-A-Y-N-E. Okay, Ms. Payne, um, where do you, have you lived in Bay County or Clayton County in close proximity? Uh, I don't want to get out of addresses, but have you lived the majority of your life? I have. I was born and raised in Clayton County and then moved to Fayette okay. when I was eight. Do you uh, have any family members that are law enforcement? Do I do you not. recall? Um, uh, what do you do for them? Um, I'm in property management for apartment communities and I've been in that industry now for going on 10 years. Okay, and so you came straight out of high school into that? I did. And, and that kind of industry, what do you do for, um, for your job? Typically, I'm in the field. I go from property to property, um, either collecting rent, um, sometimes walking vacant and or abandoned apartments that could potentially be under construction. And I would show vacant apartments to um, potential renters. Okay. So at times you were carrying basically tills for your company of large amount of money? Correct, yes. Okay. And um, you testified that on some occasions or more occasions you have to show empty properties or empty uh, locations to people that you don't know or that you're told to by your company? Correct. Okay. Whether it be vacant apartments or vendors, either or. And how do you feel about that? I mean, it's, it's a part of my job. Um, in the beginning, we had smaller properties where I was the only person who was going from property to property. Um, there were occasions that were unsettling, but it was it was still a part of my job. And the longer that I was with the company, the larger we got, the more properties we received, um, and the more I guess it it put me more out um, alone by myself, without additional site staff, without anybody with me. And. They would know that you were going to these sites, correct? Uh, correct. Not exactly which ones. I would be kind of all over the place, depending on which ones I was going to. And because you were going to all these different places to meet people you don't know, did you do anything for your safety? I did. And what was that? I um, registered for a concealed carry permit, and when I received it, I purchased a firearm. Did your company know about this? Um, they did, yes. And were they in support of this? That was, yes, they were. And it was, un, it was not unusual for other individuals with the same type of work to wear a gun or have a gun? Uh, no, not at all. Okay. And you said you purchased a gun. Uh, what kind of gun did you purchase? Uh, it was a Springfield, and it was a XD because um, it was smaller, so I was able to keep it concealed. Okay. And you got a valid permit, correct? Correct. What else did you do to help uh, make sure that carrying a permit or carrying a gun on your side would be safe? I would go to the shooting range and at different shooting ranges they offer kind of like a variety of options um, including self-defense kind of classes or tutorials rather. And did you ever take one of those classes or tutorials? I did. And which one did you take? Um, it was it was a while ago, so I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly, but it was a self-defense um, training course. Okay. And in this training, what did you learn from what they were teaching? Just how to properly store your weapon, how to properly remove your weapon, how to make sure that your safety when doing so doesn't cause accidental discharge. Um, and they would explain how when you pull your weapon out that the way you hold it is determined, is determined based on what you're ready to do. In other words, you keep your index finger on the slide 
until you're ready to pull the trigger. When you're ready to pull the trigger is when you put your finger into the trigger guard. All right, now when you say the slide, um, is that the top yeah. portion, the side portion, or like, is it a combination of both? Like the side. Okay. How your hand would norm just rest. And is that all that um, they were training for at that time? Um, for the most part, yes. Okay. I mean, they taught us, you know, how to load or unload and smaller things like that, but. Have you ever had a accidental discharge of the firearm while loading or unloading? No. Okay. And did you commonly wear this weapon? Uh, every day. Where'd you wear it? On my person, you mean? Mm-hmm. I had a holster that went inside of my pants and I wore it on my front right hip. Was that visible to individuals? No. Okay. And did you do that purposely? I did. Okay. And uh, do you recall uh, May 7th of 2019? I do. Prior to that day, have you ever had to draw your weapon or find yourself in a position where you would need to? No. Okay. Um, so on this May 7th, of course, you've been hearing these stories. Could you tell us what happened on that day? I can. Um, I was on my way home from work and I was coming up to an intersection where the light had just turned green. As I was getting ready to turn left, there was a semi that was turning right. Um, someone ran the red light and I watched him run right into the tractor trailer. Okay. I pulled off to the side and I got on the phone with 911 to just to give an account of what I had noticed. Um, I had assumed that the truck driver or someone else that was involved had already called and they hadn't. And if I could stop you right there, you said that you pulled off to the side, whereabouts? Um, I pulled up onto the curb, okay. right through the intersection. And why did you do that? I wanted to get out of the lane of travel. Okay, so there was heavy traffic that day? It was pretty steady. Okay. And is that where you called the 911? It is, yes. Okay, and then what did you do? Um, after I got on the phone with 911, I was kind of explaining everything that I saw, and I started to walk over to the truck driver because um, I noticed that there was someone else who had witnessed it who pulled off to the side. And if, I'm sorry, nurse. You said you walked up to the truck driver. What was that driver's name? Uh, I believe it was Mr. Kimball. Okay. All right, go ahead. So I um, walked over to the truck driver and we kind of just were conversing, asking, I don't even know what happened. And he just was confirming that we did have a green light. So um, I noticed that someone else had walked over to the other vehicle that was involved and was checking on them. I after talking to Mr. Kimball for a while, um, he was on the phone with his dispatch the entire time, and so I was kind of relaying everything that happened so that they were able to hear it from me and not just from him. Relaying it to whom? To his um, job. Okay. So his supervisor, I would assume. All right, so you're speaking with him, relaying to the dispatch about what was going on, confirming the light was green for him. Correct. And then what else happened? Um, after that, we were kind of just standing there waiting for the police to arrive and um, the other gentleman who had witnessed it walked over to us and he introduced himself and said that he was a state officer and he flashed his badge and said that he had checked on the other gentleman and that was asking us, are we okay? Is everybody all right? Um, and actually told me that he had saw where he ran the red light and confirmed it to Mr. Uh, Kimball as well. Okay. <clears throat> now, Clara, he came and um, identified himself as a state uh, officer? Correct. Okay. And you've heard a couple of times it being called a correctional officer or another name. Are you sure he, he identified himself as a state officer to you he told and to Mr. Kimball? 
cor correct. He told me that he was a state officer. I didn't find out that it was a correctional officer until months later when I found out from you. But he did show a badge? He, he did. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, he didn't pull it off. He just lifted his shirt and we saw the badge and then he continued. And how was he speaking to you or how was his demeanor to you and Mr. Kimball? He was trying to make sure everyone was okay, um, making sure that we kind of stayed over here and that anything that you know we could remember that happened, we were kind of going over it with him. Um, but he, he seemed to be comfortable with the situation and making sure that all of us felt comfortable, I guess is the best way to explain it. Okay. So your voice on the 911 appeared to be kind of calm and so that was the tone or how you perceived everybody's tone as this was continuing on? For the most part, I think that me and the truck driver were kind of more calm. Um, the officer, the way that he, it was kind of like he was, I don't know any other term other than kind of hyped up. Like he just, he wanted to make sure that he was in charge in a way. Okay. And what else did he um, state while you were sitting there waiting on the police to arrive? Well, we were, me and the truck driver were curious because we didn't know what had just happened. It seemed obvious that he ran the red light. So we were asking him if he was okay and if he was, if there was something going on. And he said, he's okay, but he said he's definitely inebriated. Are you sure that's the word he used? I'm positive because it prompted both me and the truck driver to reply simultaneously saying, do you mean he's drunk? Okay. And um, did Mr. Kimball's dispatch hear or overhear that conversation or hear the conclusion? I'm not sure, to be honest. Okay. So the state officer said that and it kind of sparked yours and Mr. Kimball's attention. What happened next? Um, afterwards, we're still standing around probably another um, maybe 10 or 15 minutes now, um, additional from the original 10 minutes or so. And me and Mr. Kimball are continuing to speak and um, the state officer had walked back over because at this time the guy in the truck had got out of his vehicle. Okay. And when he got out of his vehicle, did the state officer address him? Uh, he did. And what was said? He was just asking him what was he doing and what are you, where are you going, you know, just come out of traffic because his truck was still in the lane so there were still cars that were passing and he was just basically trying to make sure you need to just come out the way and stay out of traffic. So the, from your perception, the state officer was remaining calm, trying to direct, um, at that time you didn't know, but now you do know, Mr. Herring, to be safe and get out of harm's way, correct? Originally, yes. Okay. And then what continued from there? Um, I couldn't hear what they were saying, but he kind of started walking around and um, the officers started following him around the vehicle and you could see him having conversations, but again, I couldn't hear what they were saying. And when you said walking around, walking around where? Um, his truck. And just in that proximity of just his truck? Yes. Okay, sorry, continue. So after he was walking around for a little bit, he kind of started, uh, he being the state officer, started to walk back over to us and he was kind of just giving us this look like this, this guy is, there's something, there's something that's up. And before anybody could ask, or either of us could ask him what he meant, he walked back over to him. Um, I was actually on the phone with my family when I was on my way home from work, which I hung up to call the police. So during this time is when I took that opportunity and I kind of walked back to my vehicle and I was on the phone. I called my family back to let them know uh, what was going on. And it was to let them know what's going on or let them know that you were safe or? Correct. Okay. And is that when you made the second call, the 911 call? It is. Um, I noticed from a distance that it was getting more 
attention, I guess. Um, couldn't hear the conversations, but I could see the hand movements and the gestures between the two of them. Um, again, I don't know what he was saying, but it was almost like he's trying to explain to him something, which is when I told them, I'm going to call you guys back. I'm going to call the police back because something else is is going on because he started walking towards his vehicle again, like the driver's side at that time. And when you called 911 the second time, was it kind of the same manner you did the first time? It was. Um, I was just basically explaining to them what I, what it looked like was about to take off, take place, um, uh, assuming and hoping that they would say, "Okay, well, we actually have an officer. He's literally right there." Given the time frame, I would have assumed that someone would have been there by then. Okay. How many accidents have you seen before this one? Um. I mean, passed on the road, a few, witnessed firsthand, none. And have you ever been in an accident yourself? No. Okay. So this is the first time you're encountering any kind of accident really firsthand or close by? Yes. Okay. And you get back on the phone with 911, and what occurs then? I'm explaining to them um, what I thought that we had learned was that um, the driver who had caused the original accident was potentially drunk. And, and that came from what the state the officer state. said? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Um, and as I'm explaining it to her, I notice that's when he completely gets in his truck. He starts trying to turn it on and you can hear him like revving it to get it to turn on, um, which I, I think that all of us were shocked that it even turned on to begin with. And that's when he he started to drive away. And you said you were shocked. Why were you shocked that it started back up? I, there was fluids everywhere. It was smoking. There was, I mean, it was damaged. Was there a major impact? There was, yeah. I mean, the entire tractor trailer just shifted and rocked when he hit him. Okay. And you don't know what speed he was going at going through the red light? I don't. Okay. But you did see the effects it had on the 18 wheeler? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you are on the phone with 911. You see him jump into his vehicle, revving it up. So what happens then? Um, I'm just basically just telling dispatch that that's what's happening. I am explaining to her. He just got in his car and she asked me um, if I was able to get the tag number as he's pulling away. Were you able to get the tag number? At that point, I wasn't, no. Did it appear anybody had gotten the tag number? No. And were They were just trying to get out of the middle of the road. So people were trying to get out of the way. Was anybody screaming, get the tag number, or? I mean, at the time, all I could see was the state officer and the truck driver kind of, the state officer was kind of grabbing the truck driver, kind of telling him, you know, to get out of the way. Um, Where was this truck driver standing? They were, so if, if this was the, the lane where they were turning and the truck was kind of partially turned, they were standing at the, like, kind of the middle part of the intersection, which would have been middle part of the tractor trailer, which is kind of in front of Mr. Herring's vehicle. Okay. Did it uh, ever appear that any of them might have been in jeopardy of being hit when Mr. Uh, Heron was starting up his vehicle? Um, initially, it's not the first thing that came to, I think, anybody's mind. But then once he started revving it and just kind of took off, then yeah. Okay. And then what happened? So I'm explaining to the dispatch what happened. And as he's pulling off, she's asking me, you know, was I able to get the tag number? Realizing I wasn't able to, I was already at my vehicle and I got in my, I completely got in my vehicle and went to go pull off. Okay. And at that time, the uh, truck driver and the state officer was still standing over in the street and he started waving me over, like calling me towards him. Okay. And when you got up close to him, what happened? Um, he, I asked him, did he go straight? And he said, yes. And he's telling me, he said, go. 
So at that time, you were under the impression that he's a state officer sending you to get the tag, and 911 knows that you're on the way to get the tag. Correct. Right. And he was, when I was in my vehicle, when he was waving me over, his motions were, it was almost like he was waving me on. So when he brought me up, when I got up to him is when he told me to go. Okay. And he said go, or did he say something else, or? No, he just said, good, go, go. Okay. All right, so then now you're, you're going in the direction they pointed you, and you're on the phone with 911. Was 911 saying anything? Uh, no, she was not. She, All right. I was just, there was kind of silence from the time that she had initially asked me if I had got the tag. Um, I was still kind of getting my bearings, and I just started repeating to her, telling her, okay, you know, he's going down um, Clark Howell or right. Forest Parkway. So you never heard them give a warning of not to chase or? No. <clears throat> and having heard the tape, did you feel that um, you were talking over it or you just didn't hear it or? No, I was explaining to her as we were, as we were going down the road, I'm explaining to her what's happening. And from what, how I remembered it, she asked me again, so were you able to get it? And I explained to her, not yet, but I am about to. And that's when she told me that she just wanted me to be safe. I told her that I understood um, and that I wasn't chasing. I was just going to follow, just stay behind him, to stay with him until the police officer could get to us. So I was able to kind of accurately, basically just keep them in the loop since they obviously weren't there yet. Okay, um, so your impression at that point is that you're just going to get the tag and then hopefully that'll be it, you just report the tag? Correct. Okay, and did 911 ever come on and say, hey, we've already got the tag from somebody else? No, they, she never did. Okay, so um, as you're getting up close to get the tag, what happens then? As I'm getting closer, um, I explained to her that I had the tag, and she basically tells me that this is the way that I interpreted it, was that she wanted both of us to go back to the original accident site because police should be there by now. All right, was that, did she say something before that about you just returning or the only thing you heard was that both of y'all needed to be? Cor correct, she just told me she wanted me to be safe. I told her I felt like I was safe. And that's when she, I told her that I was gonna stay with them until an officer could get to us. Um, and she said that that's what she wanted me to do. At any time did you identify you had a gun or was carrying a gun? I didn't. So you're following the individual to get his tag, and you get it, and then your interpretation of what was said is that they wanted both of y'all to come back to the scene. Correct. So what did you do at that point? At that point is when um, we had both come up to the intersection, and I saw him stopped in the turning lane. So I turned as well and when I stopped I was under the impression with me having 911 on the phone that I could just be kind of like a messenger so I took my phone on speaker and I took it to him to show him that I had the police on the phone and I'm telling him they want us to go back to the original accident site at this point, you y'all have not made contact, correct? No, we have not. So how far do you think you pulled over the distance between you and his truck? Um, well, he was in the turning lane, and I was in what would be considered like the right straight lane. Um, and the distance between the vehicles were probably I don't, I, maybe the width of this table 
But there was no contact, correct? No, there was not. Okay. And did you have any fear that something was going to happen by walking up to him with the phone? I didn't think I had anything to fear. I assumed that having authorities on the phone explaining that to him, that that would just mean, okay, we'll go back. Because you had not heard what the interchange between him and the state officer, correct? I had not, no. Okay. And as you approached him with a phone, how did you have it in your hand? Um, I had it on speaker and I was kind of holding it like in my palm with it kind of resting in my hand, just like facing him so that he could see it says 911. Now you mentioned that he was internally and was stopped, correct? Correct. Did you cause him to stop? I did not. And why would he be in stop in that lane? The only thing that I could think of was either he was merging and his vehicle finally gave up um, or that it, but it, okay, so the way that the lanes merged, I was assuming that he was either waiting for traffic, but then getting up closer, you can see all of the liquid like underneath the vehicle, you can see the truck is smoking. Okay, and, and you said earlier that it might have just finally exhausted. Correct. Okay. I mean, and even when we were back at the original accident site, the um, the state officer and even the truck driver, but they were they were adamant that they don't understand how this truck has it just kind of blown. Was how they were describing it. Okay, so. You intend to walk up with the phone, tell them, hey, the police are on the phone. What happened then? I was walking up to him, and I am explaining that I'm on the phone with the police and that they wanted us to go back to the original accident site. Um, it's loud. We're near an interstate. It's a busy road, and I can't hear what he's saying t to me. But as I got closer, I heard him um, asking me, who the F are you? And I told him that I was nobody, but that I had the police on the phone. Um, and that they wanted us to go back to the original accident site. Okay. So you'd explain that to him. Did you have the phone close to you? Did you have it away from you? Where was the phone? It was kind of not extended, but partially of the way. Okay. And uh, what happened then? Um, apparently I was close enough for him to reach out the car and he knocked my phone out of my hand and he grabbed me by my wrist and he pulled me into the vehicle. Okay. Now, you said apparently you got too close to the vehicle. Did it appear to you you were too close to the vehicle or? I wasn't thinking that I needed adequate space to stay away from him or anybody or anything. Okay. And then you said he knocked the phone out of your hand. Yes. And then he grabbed you. You said one was on your wrist. And where was the other hand? Um, and originally he had just grabbed my wrist. And he had pulled me in the car, and um, at some point my shirt had gotten grabbed. Okay. Um, and he. Go ahead, I'm sorry. He was pulling my wrist, and he pulled me in the vehicle, and he kept yelling at me, telling me, I have something for you. Um, and he used. I have some pardon, but I have something for you, bitch. And he's leaning and he's reaching and he's pulling. And at this point, I remember that I'm I'm sorry. Take your time. I remember that he had let go of my wrist and he grabbed me by the back of my neck. And it was as if he was trying to 
kind of keep a hold of me. Um, the entire time I'm, I'm telling him, I'm, I'm thinking, I I'm still have to be on the phone with the police. They have to know. Um, I'm telling him to let me go. And that's when he hits the gas and we go forward. Um, I'm still in the car at this point and while it only may have been a few steps or a few feet, um, when you are being held against your will and you have no idea what's ahead of you and you're looking down, it felt like it lasted forever. And I just remember, it was like I saw my, like my light flash before my eyes and I thought I was going to go down Riverdale Road, um, out hanging out the side of this car. And the whole time, are you trying to get away from this situation? I'm trying to pull away from him, yes. And how did you do that? Um, I, my entire body was up against the vehicle and I'm just trying my hardest to push away with any part of me that I can, whether it was my, my arms or my knees, trying to just put distance in between me and the vehicle thinking I could get away from it and uh, it was unsuccessful. And at one part you hear yourself screaming, get the F out of the car, um, what was going on then? I'm thinking that I have a better chance of not being drugged if he's not in the vehicle. Hold here is a bag that's been labeled evidence that we're going to call it defense. Exhibit number 39, 38, 39. Okay, and as you can see, it has been sealed and not open. At this time, Your Honor, I'm going to approach the witness, although, although I'm not sure until I open it. She can it. Do you see the writing on this right here? Yes. Okay. Does that identify a article of clothing? It does. Okay. And at this time, I'm going to open the evidence. Yes. 
along with the rips in that shirt, was there any other part of your body that had any kind of marks from where he grabbed you? Uh, yes. Okay, where were those? I had marks on the back of my neck and kind of scratches along my arms, bruisings um, on my wrists, and scratches along my chest. Okay. Anything in the facial area? Yes. Um, I had a kind of a black eye, but a bruised eye and a busted um, upper lip. And other, I guess, like sore spots, like or bruising and redness around the edges of my face. And all of this occurred while he was dragging you uh, forward towards your vehicle? Correct. Okay. And you said he was making a statement to you of, I've got something for you, bitch. Was there any other statements made that you can remember at this time? No, he just kept telling me that kind of over and over again and that I was nobody. Now, what was he doing in the vehicle while this was all going on? Um, before, but before he punched the gas is when he was kind of turning his body and he was reaching, like reaching behind him. Did you see what he was reaching for? I, no, I did not. Did you see any of the contents of the inside of his vehicle? Jury, no. Okay. I could see that there were things everywhere, but other than that, I didn't really. <clears throat> Have you ever experienced anything like that prior to this incident? No. Okay. And then what happened then? Um, well, after the reaching is when he pa mashed the gas. And when he mashed the gas, I, like I said, have no understanding of how far we went, how much farther we can go. At that point, I didn't know that it, we had stopped because we hit my vehicle. Um, and that's when I uh, drew my weapon. Right, now you said mashing the gas. What did that sound like? Uh, you could hear the, the truck just revving and hissing from like the um, liquids spewing and it was, it was loud. Okay. And you stated that then you said you have a gun? I did. And what was your intent at that point? Um, my intent was that pulling it out, he would let me go and I'd pull away from the vehicle and that would be it. Did you ever stop trying to pull away from the vehicle? No. And Explain to me how you uh, pulled your gun out uh, at that time. Um, it was in my holster on my right hip, and he had a hold of me, and I just, I, I pulled it out and immediately started trying to just continue to push against the door with it, like pushing away from him. Okay. And as you're pushing away from the door, what happens then? Um, he grabbed my hand with the gun in it. Okay, let me, let me talk. Which arm did you pull, or which hand did you pull the gun with? It was my right hand. Okay. And you said he grabbed your wrist. Which wrist? He grabbed my right wrist. All right, and how did he have that wrist? Um, well, with one of his hands, he actually grabbed my wrist to pull it towards him. Could you tell which hand or arm he had grabbed your wrist with? Um, it was his left okay. because he had a hold of he he had released me with this hand from my neck to grab me with this hand. Okay. And the gun that was outside the door that you're pushing away from, he got a hold of that, correct? Correct. And what happened then? Um, after he originally grabbed it and was kind of pulling at it back and forth, is um, when he put his other hand on top and he started trying to actually yank it away from me. Um, and then he started to try to turn it, to pry it almost, like he was trying to pry it out of my, my hands so that he could take it away and. Which angle was he trying to pry it out of your hand? 
um, like a, a way for me. So it was this way. Okay. And that obviously is not the way your wrist is supposed to move, correct? Correct. Is, is that what caused the bruising or the... It is. Okay. And you said he's trying to push it this way and pry it out of your hand? To me, it's what it felt like. Like he was trying to pry it out of my hand. And yes. you said another hand came over and grabbed it? Yes. Okay. From the top. Your Honor, so that uh, I can give you a good understanding that the jury can see it. If I may approach to do a demonstration of what she's saying. You may. This is a toy gun. Toy gun. Um, And even though it's a toy gun, it does have a slide on it. As you can see, that it can pull back. There's nothing that's done with a toy gun. So, if this is the gun that you have. He was pointing it, say I and him, in his seat. How, was he, how did he have your wrist? Like this? This hand was here, yes. Okay. And the gun was here, he's pulling you forward. Yes. And you said he had you here but on this? He was closer. All right. So, and he had your shoulder with this hand, or what was this hand doing? That he let go. He let go. Once he got a hold of this wrist. So he came. And he, he grabbed the gun. All right, you tried to grab the gun like this. Correct. Okay. And where was your finger? The same way that I have it now. And when he grabbed like this, that shows his fingers are right there over the trigger? Correct. Is that a correct? I mean, so, yes. But so it's possible any of the four digits got into that trigger. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so that occurred, and he's grabbing the gun like that. What happens next? Um, he's pulling at it. He's pulling at it, and I'm just yelling at him to stop, thinking that if I could just get away, it'll just be over, I guess. Were you saying anything to him at this time? To stop? Were you saying it loudly? Yeah, over and over again. Yeah, I was screaming it. Okay, and then what happened? Um, as he's turning it towards, like that way, I'm being pulled and pulled, and I can feel myself like pressing up against the car, like my face is up against the door. And as he's pulling it is when it, the truth, the gun went off. Okay. And you saw the pictures that showed your hand kind of pulled back. Um, why would your hand or arm been pulled back like that? After it went off, my entire body kind of fell backwards. Like I, I was almost like I was falling over and I was trying to catch my balance. Um, and my arm was turned so far in that once it was went off and I was released, it just kind of sprung back. What was going through your mind at that time? A lot. Um, I, I, I knew that I was still had to be on the phone with 911 and that I was just trying to get away from where I've been trying to get away from for the last however many minutes, and then I needed to communicate back to 911 what had happened. So you picked up the phone and? I, I turned and I picked up my phone that was on the ground, and I, I told her what happened. Okay. At any time, did you look around for a shell? To no. pick up a shell? No, I did not. Were you concerned about a shell? I was not at all. Okay. And when you got on the phone with 911, you stated that he pulled the trigger? Yes. And what else did you state? Um, to her, I had told her that he had just pulled the trigger on my gun. Um, and I remember kind of looking around and, and I noticed behind me that there was someone who was standing behind me. and. I asked them if, if they seen everything, if they would stay to, you know, be a witness. Um, and he was asking, like, if we were okay. He's like, are you okay? Is everything okay? And 
I told him, uh, said, I, I mean, I am, but no, he's not. Yeah. And I asked, um, I asked the, the dispatch for uh, an ambulance. Okay. So your concern at that point was to try to get dispatch to send the ambulance out? Correct. Did you look around to see if anyone were close? I or? did. And, and I, that's when I noticed that there were actually, I mean, there were police that were, to me, felt so close that all of this could have just, just been avoided. But you had no foresight or any kind of anticipation that it would conclude like this? I had no idea. And it appears that a lot of witnesses did come up to confront you or to uh, say what they thought they'd saw? I mean, originally, the, everyone that was standing around, they weren't, they weren't like saying anything direct. Everyone was asking each other what happened. Everyone was trying to figure out like, well, where, where did this car come from and how did this happen? Um, did any of them or one particular stick out to you? Only the one that was right next to me because I, I was assuming that he saw the whole thing. And did you know his name at that time? I did not. After seeing him get up and testify, do you know his name? I do. And what was his name? Uh, Cameron. Cameron. Williams. Okay. And he did stay around? Um, he did. I don't know where he went exactly. He kind of started to walk around where everybody else was. Um, and it was like I was still on the phone with 911 and I'm trying to explain to her what's going on but at this point I just I'm kind of in a, a bit of a daze I didn't it was all over the place honestly and what did you do with the gun um, I reholstered it I took the holster off my hip and I put it back in the holster okay and did it stay in that condition till the police came it did um, I remember looking up and seeing that there was a police officer who was coming up from where he would have been at like the interstate area um, and as he was walking up I was trying to get his attention because he was like walking towards all the bystanders having no idea what was going on having no idea who was involved with what or where or how uh, and I was trying to get his attention so that he knew here's the weapon so that he could have it. All right, now you said that the, a lot of crowds were saying stuff, trying to confirm what had happened. Uh, did you hear all that they were saying? Um, it was more a bunch of kind of questions. Um, after the police officer had come up, one of the people that was standing there were basically, again, asking what had happened did you, and she, she asked me, she said, did you just shoot him? And I told her, I said, no. I said, he, he pulled me into the vehicle. He had a hold of me, but that I never had my finger on the trigger. And why is that? I mean, number one, from training. And number two, I never had any intention on pulling the trigger. And in fact, you never did pull that trigger, did you? Correct. Now, the officers, of course, came up, took your gun, and was there another officer that you encountered at that time? Um, there was. I was standing on the sidewalk. I was just trying to stay out of the way. And the original officer who I handed my, uh, my gun to um, went into Mr. Herring's truck. Okay. And the other officer had come up, and everyone was kind of like, you know, pointing towards me, basically. And he walked up to me and just told me that until they could figure out what was going on, that I would be detained. Okay. So, as you said, kind of this fog's going on and you're in shock. Um, did you ever see that there was an opportunity to try to render assistance, or did that even cross your mind? From the time that it happened to the time that the police officer got there, the initial response for me was, I was away from this vehicle. 
and I wasn't trying to interject myself back into a situation that I had just got away from. Yeah. And when the other officer detained you, did you did he put you somewhere? Um, he did in the back of the police car. 